Howdy folks, howdy, 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 and welcome to another long-awaited episode of Nerdstagic with me, your host, Luke, the Ginger Bookworm. As you can tell, I, I am incredibly excited, and if you're hearing this on your radio or on your phone, best to turn your uh, speakers down a bit, because I I just started in with a shout, because I am generally really excited for, for this episode. Um, bit of housekeeping before we get on with it. Uh, first of all, I want to apologise for no episode last week. Um, went out on the Sunday, uh, came back fine, had a headache, kind of thought I'd sleep it off, woke up the next day, incredibly bunged up with a really bad cold, had, a, like I said, a really bad headache, and that lasted me all week. I tested myself, so it's not it's not COVID, so no need to worry about that. It was just a very, very mild, like, well, say mild, very strong cold, so I was out of the game for a while. But this is a good thing, because it gave me another week of preparation for this big episode which i'm hoping is going to be my biggest ever and uh, you guys will enjoy it and you guys will find it quite fascinating be as passionate and enjoyful as as i am right now like i said i'm really overjoyed with this one i've been waiting so long to do it and i woke up this morning with a spring in my step i need i wanted to get everything done out of the way all the human life stuff first so i can get on doing this little thing for you uh, folks listening so uh, i want to apologize for not being here but upside it, might, it means more research and more time spent on, on this so it's going to be as big as best as possible so there's that's housekeeping out the way uh so as you can see by the title uh, you probably figured it out some of you might know what i'm going to talk about today some of you might not so for those of you that don't that read the title and was a bit confused uh I'm going to talk about one of my favourite recent movie um, discoveries. And uh, there's going to be stories, there's going to be a breakdown, there's going to be, well, not a breakdown of me, but a breakdown of the movie. Maybe I might break down because this is a very lovely, passionate movie. We'll see. I haven't, think, I haven't sort of planned that out, but if it happens, it happens. But there's going to be a lot of stories and there's going to be a breakdown of the, of, um, the movie. Um but yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is the beautiful, beautiful French film, Amelie. Uh, Amelie and me. I thought that was quite clever when I came up for it. I was very pleased with myself. Um, for those of you that don't know the movie Amelie, as I said, it's a French film directed by, and I'm going to butcher the name, by uh, Jean-Pierre, I think it's Ju Junette, Junette. I don't know why. Whenever I do French, I always go to like a French accent. Even when I was studying French in school, I always did the French accent. I don't know why. My teacher always said it just come with the language. I just thought it was a, you know, I just thought it was me being silly. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the movie came out in 2001. Uh, it was released uh, in the UK and around the world on DVD uh, in 2002, which were, I heard about it in, back in 2002 when I was a, a wee little sprout. Uh, well, little carrot because I'm ginger. Uh, and uh, uh, main character, Amelie, is played by Audrey. I want to say Tatu because it's uh, T A U T O U. So Tatu. If I'm butchering it, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm trying my best. I've been practicing the the the, the French names uh, quite a bit. But even so, like I'll get it one time and I'll miss it again. Um, it has a thirty eight uh, thirty nine percent uh, certified fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It's currently, if my little sort of deep dive and review of this film uh, interests you uh, or fascinates you, or you want to check it out, it's currently available on. Netflix here in the UK. I'm not sure about other places in the world, but I know for sure that it's on Netflix in the UK, and I'm really happy because ever since I saw it, it was on Netflix here in the UK, I have just been recommended every, every, every which person I meet, really strangers, saying that you've got to watch Amelie. You haven't seen Amelie? You've got to watch Amelie. It's generally just one of those most heartwarming, beautiful uh, movies I've seen in years. And I've never seen anything like it. The only thing, the, the thing that's got the closest to this movie in, in terms of style and uh, the way it is and its mannerisms uh, was Wes Craven. I mean, uh, Wes Craven. Uh, uh, pause. pause. Uh, sorry, give me words out. Not Wes Craven, Wes Anderson. Now, I know what people are probably thinking. Wes Anderson, he's not French. He's American. Specifically, he's from Texas. Uh, but if you watch any Wes Anderson movie, 
you will know and you will see that his movies are highly influenced by French cinema, um, European sort of movies. I, I love Wes... Uh, I keep trying to say Wes Craven. I don't know why. I'm a big fan of Wes Anderson movies and I'm a big fan of him. I love all his films. I've still got to watch uh, the French Connection uh, movie that he's done quite recently. I know it's on Disney+. Plus. haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, but I know I will love it. I know I'll think it's amazing. The Royal Tenenbaums that he did was incredible. One of my favourite movies he's ever done was The Grand Budapest Hotel. Absolutely just perfect. You know, uh, even Fantastic Mr. Fox that he did, which was a Roald Dahl book. Uh, it was, it, even though it was following on from Roald Dahl and it had Roald Dahl styling, it was still a Wes Anderson movie. You know, if you Roald Dahl had never existed and never wrote Fantastic Mr. Fox and Wes came up with that story, you wouldn't know by looking at at the film because it just, it feels so much like his style. And that's what I'm saying with Amelie. Is just, the film's so unique and so different. I've never seen anything like it before. And the only person I can think who's got even close to the way this film is shot and the way it looks and the feel is Wes Anderson. Um, so that's give will give you a good idea as to what kind of film this is and and the way the shots are and the lighting and the colours and I'll get onto that in more detail um, as we move on. But it's a very sort of heartwarming sort of film, and um, it's going to be a fun. Like I already now, I'm I'm still in the introduction and I hadn't even got around to breaking it down and I'm all very sort of giddy and cheerful about it and I can't wait to really deep dive. So I'm going to start wasting. My precious time, well, my precious time, your precious time. I've got all the time in the world. You guys are probably busy. Um, so I'm going to get on with it. I'm going to get into a bit of story time. And then when story time's over, we'll break it down. And then we'll have a, a well, I say have a discussion. I'll have a chat. You guys listen. And hopefully, if you follow me on Twitter, we can have a discussion there. So let's get on with uh, the story time, shall we? So where where did my discovery, where did my fascination, where did my love for this movie begin? Well, I'm glad you asked, uh, dear listener, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, it started in 2002 when I was, let's say, oh, I was born in 98. So I was about four or five, depending on as, as when I listened to it, like if it was before my birthday or after. So it was about four or five. And I remember my mother, she bought me a film called Thunderpants, which most people probably have never heard of, which again, I don't, I'm not surprised because it, it's a very weird film. Uh, basically, going off subject a little bit, but the movie stars Rupert Grint um, from Harry Potter. Um, I think he I think he had done the first Harry Potter film. And this was like the second or third film he had done. And um, basically, the basic premise of it, you've got this one kid who's born with two stomachs and he farts. And it's a very childish, silly sort of film, uh, very much for kids. Rupert Grint's a genius and builds him these special sort of pants where he can fart and it will uh, displace the gas so that, you know, uh, the, the, the little boy can have a somewhat normal life. It's a very heartwarming, silly sort of fart joke sort of film. Um, but I remember... When that film, when I got that film, I don't know. Oh, then again, I haven't really bought a DVD in a long time, so I'm, I guess they would still do it. Um, but you know, when you buy a DVD, you'd get all the trailers beforehand, and one of the trailers that started before um, this, well, before Thunderpants, was Amelie, and I, I still remember the seeing it and. Just being like, this film seems so interesting, so so different. And even at the, like a young age, I was just kind of like taken in of like, this film looks really odd, you know, very strange. It like again, I was still young, but I'd never seen anything like it before because again, it was a very French sort of film, and I was used to westernized sort of movies, English and American and so on sort of films. So, and obviously, films in different cultures and different places are. are different to wherever else in the world because it's all about the people and what the the country likes and what the society of that of that town and the culture changes how each thing is um, so if you watch a movie that's made in france it'd be very sort of different to a movie that you watch that was made in the uk 
it's just down to the people and how movie makers in certain countries are and behave. So, but as a young age, I, I was just kind of just taken aback of how different the film is, and I didn't know it was French, obviously. And I was just, oh, I can't, you know, that looks interesting. I can't really wait to see that. It seems like a silly little sort of, I was, I would say, kids movie. You know, I didn't know any better. I just thought it just seems like a silly little warm sort of film. Um, and I never saw it again. Never saw it again. I, I didn't remember what it was called. I didn't know anything. It was just a little film that caught my eye as a trailer, as what the trailer is meant to do. It caught my eye, it caught my attention, at, even at a young age. And that was it. You know, onto onto Thunderpants. And I watched the film, enjoyed it. Great time. And I watched that film multiple times. And I would never skip the ads. Uh, I'd always watch it. And I'd always see that film. And it'd always take me. But I'd never be... Like, again, I was too young to really understand what what it, the film was or that you know it, it was it wasn't like an english movie or anything like that because if i remember correctly the trailer had no words in it it was all very visual based with like colors and scenes from the film and a soundtrack that is just gorgeous which i will get onto the music later on but it's just one of those sort of um one of those discoveries that even at a young age, it just it had me smitten. It just took me in and was just like, I don't understand what I'm seeing, but I know that I'm interested. I know that I like it. I know that I've got some sort of a feeling, even at a young age. I know it's quite silly to say that I was about four or five and I had this sort of feeling, but I just remember being taken aback by this trailer. And that, to me, is is a power of a good of a good movie. Because there are movies out there that are bad, but they can have fantastic trailers. You know, the Transformers movies. I love the Transformers movies, but let's admit after the dark side of the moon, they started to go downhill. But the trailers were always fantastic. The trailers were always like, that. that's quality. That's going to be a good film. And you'd go to see it. You'd be disappointed. But the power of a good movie relies on a good trailer. And just being able to, t- being taken at a very young age, being able to be so enamored by the film when I knew nothing about it, I didn't know that it was, you know, not an English movie. I didn't know anything like that. I just purely saw it, taken aback, and it just stayed with me until into adulthood. And moving on to adulthood, you know, I, I've gone through life, never really thought of it again. Haven't seen Thunderpants in years. I think the, I don't know if I still have the DVD. It's probably lost somewhere. Um, and I remember later on in life when I was a uh, I would say a teenager, but probably a bit later, probably like early college sort of uh, life. I was go. I remember, I was yeah, I was in college, and I was looking for. I like to listen. I like to listen to music while I do assignment work. Whenever I used to do any sort of writing work, any sort of assignment work, I used to listen to music, and I didn't really care what music it was. I just like to put some music on so I can drown out the background noise because I'm easily distracted. I'm easily taken away from what I'm meant to be doing by the simplest noises. And if I hear somebody have a conversation or if I hear a noise outside or anything like that, um, I'm easily, I'm I'm distracted. I'm gone from whatever I'm meant to be doing. So whenever I put music in, I I go into my own little bubble, my own little space, and I can focus on um, the work that's got to be done. And I can get it done. I can get it done quite quickly and quite proficiently. So I was looking for, for music and I'm a big fan of movie soundtracks. I collect LPs, vinyl records. Uh, majority of them are movie soundtracks. Um, I just I just find them quite sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there is a, there is a word and I've lost it. Basically, I find them very comforting because if, especially if you're a fan of the movie, you can easily put each music with each scene. And it just feels it has that familiarity, feels that confidence, and you just listen to it and you just kind of sink into it perfectly. So I found a playlist on uh, YouTube that somebody put together of all the the hundred most greatest um, movie soundtracks ever. So I just remember sitting and listening to that, and it went through loads of different ones from like Pearl Harbor, American Beauty, and whatnot. And I remember I was just doing work, and then the 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 song from Amelie started to play. Now, I have looked, and nowhere specifically on the Anchor app or Spotify can say specifically about playing music. Because usually, like on YouTube, I know you can play like 15 seconds of a song and that's okay, but anything longer, you know, it's copyright. 
and obviously I don't want to get a copyright strike on this at all. Um, so I don't think. So I, I decided not. I'm not going to play the music. So I'm going to try my best to kind of vocally do the, do do it justice, which I know I won't. Which I will move on to that in a minute. But I remember just sitting there doing doing my work, and then it started to play, and instantly I felt like a child again. I was just I had memories flitting in of being like being four or five years old, watching Thunderpants, waiting for that movie to start, hearing that song, and just being like this is like it was just unlocking memories it was just incredible it was like um dun, dun. i was like, you know i'm gonna butcher it. i'm not even gonna try i'm not even gonna try because i'm just gonna ruin it um if i, I if, if the mood tell you what when i get around to the music segment i will pause it and i will search the name and then people can go and listen to it um because I won't do it justice, but generally it's it's one of those where you hear it, you just feel comfortable, you just feel beautiful, you just feel warm. Like it's one of the most beautiful pieces of, of music, of art really, that I've heard in a long, long time, maybe even ever. It's just one of them sort of pieces that when you hear it, your just heart just sort of sinks into yourself and you just feel warm and young again. Um and I, it stopped me doing my work. I, I stopped my doing my work, and I'm like, I, "What is this?" And I remember I switched over to YouTube quickly, and I saw it. And then I, straight away, it was just a picture of Anne Marie, a picture of her beautiful face, her big eyes, her be- big beautiful smile, just staring at me. And it was just music, and I just I fell in love. And straight away, I was like, "I'm saving that to my watch later um, list." And it's ever since it's just been one of those pieces of music that I've just come back to over and over again over the years whenever whenever i'm 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 sad when i'm down and i need cheering up because it's a very happy piece of music um like it would do 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 again i'm butchering it you know i'm i'm not doing it service at all but it's a very beautiful piece of music no words all piano uh, based. Um, it's one of those sort of songs that um, it. I would learn piano just to play that one song and play that song one song perfectly. I would be happily not know what any other song to play on the piano ever if it meant that I could play that one song perfectly. You know that that's how beautiful it is and be able to play it for myself whenever I wanted to. You know, have a piano and be like, you know what, I'm just going to cheer myself up and just do 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 do. You know, just be able to just play that out or just be in a public space and just, I don't know, in a, in a cafe or something like that where they've got like a piano and just just start playing that one song. I don't know. For me, it would just be something that would be very beautiful to be able to do for myself and for others, uh, just to share that piece of music with, with people. But it was just one of those where I was like, this music is just it's, it's gorgeous and like i said it was it was one that i used primarily whenever i was upset or i was um, down or i need cheering up it was just one of the things i listened to and finally last year after having a a, a moment of a mental health struggle and i was just lying there in my bed and i was listening to this song over and over again same look it, it, it looks like it just cheers me up it's just one of those that just takes me in and um I've been meaning to to buy, to to watch the movie where the song comes. I still haven't seen the film at this point. All I've seen is the trailer. I know nothing of it. I've spoken to friends about it who've seen it. They say it's changed their lives. It's it's made them so happy. It's one of the best films I've ever watched. Like all these high praises. Went right on Tomatoes. I scored it an eighty nine certified fresh. The user score was like I think ninety two, ninety seven. It's really high. You know. Every review, I think I've ever seen about it. This movie is just perfection. And as you do when you when you're very low, when you're very sad, you you buy things or you know or you you eat or something like that. For me, this time it was like I sat and listened to this song and I thought, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna do it. So I went online, I went on eBay, and uh, I bought a secondhand copy of Emily. And uh, I thought, you know what, I. I have such an emotional attachment to this film that I need I need to to watch it. I have such an emotional attachment to this to this music that I feel that if I don't watch this film I never will. So I bought it, it came and I 
cut myself out a slice of time where I could sit and watch this film. And I remember I first watched it last year. Uh, I remember I sat down. I had a jug of Ben and Jerry's. Uh, I think it was um, caramel choo choo, possibly. Um, that's not important. It's just you know, I had there with ice cream. I was in bed, comfy, lights off. You know, it, it was getting dark outside. I put it on my TV, and for about two hours, I was just uh, enamoured. As I said, it's 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 a French movie, um, so it's French. Uh, it's French speaking, English subtitles. Um, but that doesn't matter, honestly. And I'll get onto that bit in a minute, but that generally doesn't matter. And I remember watching it, eating my ice cream, and I was just taken in for this visual experience. And it's one of those where I watched it again recently, uh, two days ago, to prepare for, for this um, episode. And it's it, even though I'd already watched it, it, it's that good that on second viewing, it's... It's you, you're noticing things that you didn't notice before. Now you know how the story pans out and the story plays. You're noticing things that you didn't notice before. I, I've noticed the reasons why certain things happen in it, um, why the character does certain things, why certain things happen. Uh, and that leads on to the end of, of the film, which no one can beat your first time seeing. Like, whenever you see, like, uh, when you first play a video game or when you first read a book or you first do something. It's never as good as the second time round, but we're here with Amber Lee. It's it hasn't gotten better, it hasn't gotten worse. It's just as good, you know what I mean. It's just as perfect the first time round. More so, like as I said, once you know the story and you know what what they're trying to say and trying to portray it and why Amber Lee does what she does and why she makes certain decisions and why the director does certain scenes and does certain things. And it all adds in is like, okay, I notice that now. I know why she's doing this. I know why the, pardon me, why the directors decided to film this two, three seconds of this one scene that I wasn't sure as to why he was doing it before. Again, it's very artsy. It's very sort of like art, visual format, you know, which that's what movies are. We've kind of lost that nowadays. The visual art of movies is is, is art, you know. It's um, painting a picture without paint. It's painting it with images with scenery with characters with story you know your paintbrush is the camera and it's how you use said uh, brush said camera is what brings out the art and brings out the the storytelling the mysticism of it and yeah i, I watched it the second time round. it was just as perfect the first time don't be wrong the first time watching this movie you will be taken away taken back um, not knowing anything, going into this movie completely blind, obviously, is a, is the best and perfect um, experience. And sadly, I say it's a sad thing, even though what I just said, even though the movie is just as perfect the second time round, I still wish that I could watch this movie for the first time again, because generally it's just one of them films that when you watch it for the first time, when you don't know anything, it is immensely beautiful. And the discovery, you feel like such a child when you discover it when you discover certain things or when Emily does certain things or when you see certain things, you're like, that's that's just beautiful. And it is beautiful the second time, but what I'm trying to, I feel like I'm I'm coming back in circles, I'm repeating myself, but I'm just trying to make sure that it, it, it's, you understand that the first time you watch this, it is incredible. Second time, incredible. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth millionth time you watch it, incredible. But that first time will always be the best time. You know, it'll always be the best version of your experience. Um, so that that's my story. That's where that's my story of me of me and Emily. The part of it, you know, not the whole sort of episode podcast. It's not just me saying this and then we're going to end now. Um, but that's my sort of experience with it, where it came from, being a young age to finding, uh, getting a Funda Pants on DVD, seeing the trailer seen it multiple times, not knowing anything about it, getting to like uh, my late teens, early adulthood with college and university, listening to uh, the song over and over again to calm me down whenever I'm upset or when I'm feeling lonely or anything like that when I need cheering up, to finally watching the movie uh, last year after a battle with mental health struggles. And honestly, I'm not just saying this, but like I was in a bad not in a bad place, but like I was kind of low with my mental health at the time. And when I watched this film, 
generally it brought me up like it and it wasn't just brought me up for a few seconds or for a minute for an hour generally for a good day or two it brought me up and i got even more excited the more now i'd seen the film i could go off to friends i could go off to family members who had also seen it and we could talk about how beautiful this film is and i could talk to to people who haven't seen the film and tell them how beautiful this movie is which then made me happier more more so and more uh, my mental health got was improved because i was sharing something that i discovered i'd shared something that i'd love i shared something that i now have such a passion for that if anybody took it away from me i would destroy them you know <laughs> um that it just brought my mental health up and i don't even remember what i was sad about you know i that memory has just been clouded over now with the memory of discovery of finally giving Amelie a go. And it since then changing my life, you know, changing my, my whole perspective on not just life, not just my life, but my perspective on what it means to be happy, what it means to be sad, what it means to be um, human. And uh, like I said, I will, I will go more into that uh, in a minute when I go into the breakdown, but yeah, Amberly, if, if, this, if I haven't convinced you yet that this movie is gorgeous and that you should stop listening to me waffle and you should go and watch it, then I hope, you know, with breaking it down, it does. Because generally, I have such a passion for this film. I have such a love for it. And it pa- it pains me that it's taken me this long to discover it. But I'm again, as I've mentioned many times before, and as it's quite evident, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm a very hippy-dippy sort of bloke. And... I feel that you experience things when the time is right. You know, you, you experience a book or a film that changes your life or changes your perspective. When your life is in need of said change, you will discover something that will change it. And I've had that with books. I've had that with, with songs, with movies, TV shows, with meeting people in real life that have changed my life completely for the good. Um, and Amelie is just one of those where... Granted, I, it pains me that I didn't discover it when I was younger, but I feel like I discovered it when I needed it, and that if I discovered it sooner, I don't think it would have been as powerful and had as an, much as an effect on me as it has, or has, has or had it had it affected me when I discovered it uh, finally uh, for the first time last year, and then rewatching it uh, for this, it's just um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful movie, and there's I could go on and I could. Sp- but so many different compliments for this film um but hopefully i've i've convinced you there and if i haven't hopefully the next segment when i break it down will convince you even more to just give this uh movie a go because like i said it's, it's gorgeous so um that's my story that's amelie and me part of it so now down to the um to the breakdown to actually breaking down this film and what makes it so wonderful beautiful and <laughs> Amazing, quality, fantastic, lovely, beautiful. It's all the words under the rainbow. Let's go into the breakdown, shall we? So, as I said, uh, I rewatched the movie again for the first time this year, a um, couple of days ago on the Monday. Uh, I had some time in the morning and I just decided I'll get up early, get as much done and then sit down and watch this beautiful film, take notes, and prepare. Now, my, uh, from a second watch, and my, my thoughts and feelings, how I feel uh, watching it again, um, as you can tell, uh, I'm very in love, I'm very enamoured, I'm very smitten by this, um, by this film. Watching it again, it just made me happy. It made me smile. Like, it improved my mood all day. Not that I, I was in a bad mood, but... Like I was just in a very happy, positive mood and the sun was shining. It was like the start of spring. Um, I sat outside and I just had a huge smile on my face. Like if I was in public, people think I was crazy because I'm just sitting there smiling to myself. Um, I just felt wonderful. And this is one of the things about this movie that I love. When I first watched it and again, watching it again for the first time this year, um, it just made me feel like a child again. And I, I, I don't know how best to ex- how to explain that. Um, as I said, like I first experienced it, you know, first experienced and discovered this movie back in 2002, um, watching the trailer. But when I remember first watching this film, it just made me remember the early 2000s. It just remi- reminded me of, you know, 
even though I was I was born in ninety eight, so I don't remember the nineties very much. But I was brought up around the nineties sort of culture, you know, because again, our early two thousands, even though it was a new millennium, a new decade, um, it was still very much people are still sort of slowly weeding away from the nineties. So I was still in a way in, immersed in the in nineties culture, and it just reminded me of just of being young, being little, and I was having memories and unlocking very of memories I haven't had since I was haven't didn't know I remembered, you know, and uh, it just made me feel so wonderful it made me feel so happy so good so warm inside i just i felt like a child again i felt like you know all of the worries of being an adult which had just flittered away and that i could go outside and i could play in the mud and i could go into muddy puddles and i could finger paint and i could um you know buy loads of toys and just play with them and create my own little world which again as an adult i could do all those things freely i might be committed for it and sent to a sound asylum but at least i'd be happy you know um and uh, you know i can buy toys and well we call them figures they're not really toy we call them statues and figures now so you know we, there's a distinction but even as an adult you know, i still kind of have what's what people would say toys but they're figures and they collect dust and i like it that way so leave me alone <laughs> you know um but yeah, it just made me feel like a child again. And then again, watching it again, I just went back. I reverted back to my childish state. And I think that's what makes me love this film so much is that it's a product of its time, yes. But it's a product of its of the time when I was alive. It was a product of the time when I was very young. Uh, and when I was, you know, very... Not that I'm not young and free now, but just when I was just carefree. Well, you could when you was invincible, when you were made out, when you were literally made out of glue and magic, you could fall out of a tree, not break a bone, and get up and laugh about it, or scuff your knee, have a little bit of a cry, and then go back on the bike and then fall off again and be like, yeah, it's the best thing ever. Whereas now I'm 24, but I do that now, and I'm sure I'm going to probably break something, or I'm going to like you know uh, feel it the next day. Like I said, I'm only young, but you get to a certain age and your body's just like, I just give up now. Like your your glue and your magic just wears off, and you just you're made out of brittle bones and hate, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's just nice to be reminded of my childhood. It's nice to be taken back for an hour, well, for two hours. I think this movie is about two hours and six minutes long. So for about two hours, just to be taken back to your childhood, just to feel young again, just to uh, to feel happy, to feel like life isn't so bad, you know, th that there's nothing bad in the world that everything is 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 nice everything is kind everything is wonderful it's just lovely to have that feeling and those were the feelings i was getting when i rewatched it you know, just how wonderful the film is and how wonderful it made me feel you know and how young it made me feel so that is that's my first sort of thoughts and my impressions of rewatching it again for this um and that's all down to what i'm going to get into next you know that it's all down to the character to the style to the music um to the deeper messages the, the seeing seeing life seeing a slice of life because uh, this that's what amelie is amelie is is a slice of life movie you know you follow amelie i think over the course of i think a few weeks to a month I th it's not really it's not really clear in the film the, the movie never the movie shows a passage of time but it's not long or huge jumps in time you know, so it's it's not really important for you to know how long the story goes on for. Um, so that's why I, I'm not really entirely sure if it's a if it's a week or a few weeks um, or a month. But it's it's the idea of one small event changes Amelie's life and just puts her on on, on a path that um, leads to her becoming the person that she wants to be, she should be and can be just by allowing herself to do certain things that she wouldn't have thought she would do um, beforehand. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to get down and gritty and oh, I don't want to say dirty because this, 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 this lady's a flower. She's a beautiful rose, and I gotta treat her with delicacy. I know you've got to throw a bit of dirt on on a rose to help make it grow, but uh, this is one of those beauty in the beast roses, you know, the kind of like perfect in a glass, 
that never will. Well, no, the one in Beating the Beast, probably a bad analogy. That one does wilt, but this one doesn't wilt. This one's a beautiful rose in a beautiful garden that never wilts and for it forever blossoms. As you can see, I've got high praise and such love um, for this character and for this film. Um, and I will admit, I, I, I have a bit of a crush on, on Emily and I have a bit of a crush on the actress um, who plays her. Um, so uh, if that doesn't come off in the next segment, and very obviously, um, I don't know what will. So enjoy me swooning over this lady that I'll probably never meet um, and why I think she's uh, incredible. So. Yeah, let's get on to the cringiness, shall we? <laughs> so, as I said, uh, Amelie is a slice of life movie. It follows the life of Amelie and who she is and how uh, her choices within the movie uh, affect uh, the people around her and how it affects her personally. Uh, I'm going to be purposely um, vague on the plot and about what happens um mainly for two reasons main reason number one is that i don't like spoiling things without giving anybody a warning um i don't like spoilers myself so i try my best not to spoil anything um for anybody um so uh i'm going to be deliberately vague so that i don't get any spoilers but number two uh and again more important than actually spoilers itself as i said as i mentioned this is one of those films that works best when you have no idea what the movie's about. You know, like I said, even even the trailer doesn't explain to you what the film's about. From my memory of the trailer, um, the film generally just shows you scenes, shows you moments. Uh, none of the scenes are coherent. None of the scenes are um, follow a narrative. They're all just little sections here and there um, from. Uh, the film that if you it's to, it's to pull you in but not to tell you anything and i think again that's a part of a good trailer a good trailer tells you nothing um i'm going to go off on a bit here but i don't know if you've uh, seen the trailer for the new kill and kill uh kill uh, movie the guy that made get out and us um his trailer that he did for his newest film which i think is i can't remember what the film's called now but his new horror film um there's no narrative cohesion to it. There's no sort of idea or concept of what this film is about. It's just scenes that are put together in such a way that tell you everything and nothing. It tells you it's a film, but it tells you nothing about the film. And that's the thing with Amelie. Um, so I'm going to be vague. I'm going to be purposely vague. Um, so when you get in, when you do eventually watch it, you know, um, you will be able to go in as I did, you know, and go in blind and just fall in love, hopefully. So, as I was saying, uh, Amelie follows the the, sto the slice of life, uh, the week or month or so of Amelie's life. Uh, and it follows sort of... Um, in 19, it's a movie set in 1997. Uh, Lady D, Lady Diana, has, has just died. And that kind of spirals into what happens um Emily she she drops um she's watching the news she drops something in her hand it hits the ground rolls off and dislodges a, a, a tile in the bathroom and um she goes down and says, oh you know what's happened she moves the tile sees there's like a little crevice a little hole in there she pulls out she puts her hand in pulls out this box full of uh, trinkets from a, a, a person who used to live in that house when he was a young boy and he hid it behind the wall and um, she just makes it her mission to go out and, and to find this person now that's not the whole story that's just a snippet of the story um, but that's what starts off the events of, of Amelie's life and uh, why the as the film follows her as she discovers who she is and um, and all that now the reason why Emily is so wonderful is, is so beautiful. Um, Emily is autistic. Now it's never made clear. It's never mentioned that she's autistic. But Emily uh, has, uh, she has a, she she has autistic. Uh, from what I've, for me watching it, and from knowing my little brother who who has autism, and uh, people in my family, and I've had and friends who've had it. I know the signs of it, 
and so even though it's never it's never properly mentioned you follow her as you follow and as you watch you can say that she does very autistic things um she likes the feel of things she likes and the way she sees the world you see it through her eyes you see you see it through the eyes of of an autistic cat of an autistic person of how they see the world because we all people who who aren't autistic we see the world as it is whereas somebody who's got autism they see the world so much differently and if anything they see the world in in such a creative and wonderful way that um we could people like myself who who aren't really autistic um could never wish or never sort of imagine how they see the world and again i will get on to it in terms of the style and the art later um but you see the world for her eyes you're following her story how she sees the world how she sees people um uh, how she feels there's there's one moment where um she is she sees something that uh, upsets her and she literally melts into a puddle of of water she just kind of just like melts away and it's that sort of feeling of your world crumbling down around you that you know in her mind up until this point of the film everything is going perfect everything is going great and then she her world gets her bubble gets burst her, she gets deflated and she just melts into um uh, a puddle of water and it's, again it's and when she was younger she was brought up um being told that like any other child would be like um she had a camera when she was younger and she was just taking photos uh, with this camera and um somebody ends up having an, a, a crash in front of her and they basically say oh it's your fault for taking pictures you caused this accident you know and Emily's taking it as gospel as truth as as it's a real thing whereas other kids would be like oh that's not true it's nothing to do with me because of the, her mannerism because of the way her brain works with her taking the photos she ends up going what put, turning on the tv and watching the news and noticing that you know there was a plane crash and that there was an earthquake and she ends up sitting there blaming herself she's like oh my god me taking photos of cause the crash outside and cause this plane to crash and cause an earthquake in this part of the world um and then she quickly sort of realizes that you know uh, well not quickly she eventually realizes that that guy was lying to her that it actually wasn't her fault and it made her feel bad for no reason so she ends up playing a prank on him and getting back at him um but Emily, she she has no friends you know she is a um what's the word she's agoraphobic she doesn't like crowds she doesn't like going out of the house uh, really she um she's an introvert growing up she had no friends uh, so she ended up having to create her own imaginary sort of friends um her mother died when she was young uh so she was just her and her dad and her dad basically just again decided that i'm never going to leave the house ever again i'm staying in my house and that's it so amelie is an adult is very much like i don't want to i don't i i have to go to work but i will go to work i won't socialize i'll go go to work come home go to work come home go to work come home and just live that sort of life um and just have my have my own little sort of my own little world you know my own little sort of slice of life my own little slice of peace um and as we go through the story and as you go, as you go through the events of her finding this little box of trinkets this little box of um uh, memories and she ends up tracking down the person and then she, she ends up doing one thing after another and it's just the the idea and the concept of um do one good thing and then kind of be like i want to have an effect on not just one person's life but i want to help other people you know it's that idea of i can't help myself you know i i'm 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 fear i've got fear of the world and i've got fear of everything around me but i know that when i help people i feel good and that makes me come out of my shell but because i can't properly help myself yet i want to help other people with their um with their lives i want to uh, how can i explain it without trying to spoil anything she gets involved in other people's lives other people's business in 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 a good way you know not in a very nosy sort of way and in a way just to to cheer other people up to make people happy to make people feel that life is worth living that there are good parts to life um there are there are parts in life that are um 
joyous. Like she, there's this one scene that I really, really love, and there's this blind man that she keeps seeing, and um, she basically she's across the road and she sees the, the blind man on the other side of the road tap him to, to, to see if if the road is clear so he can um, walk across, and um, she just walks over, grabs him under like under the arm. And then just helps him cross the road. But it's not just the fact of crossing the road. She, ASMR, basically, she just verbally tells him what he can see, what he can smell. She then goes past shops and she goes past the butchers. She goes, oh, she tell him about the different prices of meats, the different prices of cheese. Uh, she tell him what people are doing, about the, the, the kids and the smell of fruit and lollipops and uh, you know, the sounds that he can hear and the smells and what they are and where they are in terms of where he is and um she just sort of takes him she drops him off she go and just has that moment and this guy for the first time he's he sees the world for the first time she's changed this man's life where you know even though he's you know he's still virtually impaired even though he's blind he can for the first time in a in probably forever for a long time um he can see the world again for the first few seconds and it was just that heartwarming beautiful sort of moment where um she had a an effect on, on a stranger and in turn we've been doing all these things for people around her and for strangers Amberly sort of comes out of her shell and she just and comes out of her her house really and decides to talk to people she wouldn't talk to before make friends help people um and i will get on to the messages and the deeper meaning of of this movie near to the end um but the, the messages and the, and the deeper meanings that it, spurts out not just in Amelie's life but in your life you know that you the, you the listener you the watcher um the questions it, it asks you it tells you to question to ask to to think about to reflect upon um is very sort of heartwarming you learn as she learns you learn what the meaning of life you learn the meaning of happiness as she learns it you know uh, and as i said her her autism goes from being very shy, being hidden, very sort of quiet and sort of, I'm just here to do my job and I'm not here to converse, converse, com, you know, talk to people. I'm just here to to live, to survive, to go from one here to, to have my little luxuries of skimming stones to, you know, when nobody's looking, putting my hand um, in a like a bag of seed or bag of um, fruit and just being able to um, feel have that feel that wonderful feeling because again people with autism they like the feel of certain things and don't like the feel of other things um so sometimes they like rough things or they like smooth things or they like fluffy things and um it's again that's quite very clear but one of the things with, with autism as well is that like i mentioned they see the world differently and they see the small things they, they notice the things that nobody else notices that nobody would think to notice um and one of the um one of the the ways that this movie is shot which again i will go into more detail when i get into the style but as i as i said the, the film is shot in such a way that you see life through amelie's eyes you see life through somebody with autism with who is autistic somebody who has that perspective on life you will notice the small little details you you'll notice the small little things and on a second viewing as i mentioned there are things I didn't notice or made sense as to why I'm being shown this scene or being shown this small clip um, of something um, at first. But it's not until watching it on a second time round where I'm also I'm now noticing these small things that were hinted at that Amelie noticed that Amelie saw that in a first time viewing you don't know what you you what she sees and in a second time round because you know the story you notice these small little things and it's like, ah, ha, ha, I see. And you see through her eyes, you see through the eyes of somebody with autism. And again, it's very beautifully well done. It's very well shot. And it's done in, again, like in such a way where it's like, at first you don't notice it, but when you do notice it and you notice and you have that idea of the autism part in your brain, then you sort of go, I see what they did. That's really clever. And it, for me, when I noticed that the second time around, I just couldn't help not smiling because I could see perfectly what the director was trying to do, what the director's vision was. You know, I thought I knew it a first time round, but second time round, I 
understand it a lot better. And I feel like if I watched it a third, fourth, fifth, sixth millionth time, um, I feel like I would just notice more and more things. And I'm sure there's probably things hidden in that movie in the background, small little things that maybe add on to the rest of the story that I haven't even noticed yet. But again, this is where I've just got to sort of turn my, my brain to, to a different um tuned for a different wavelength and to see the world differently to see the world through the eyes of somebody who isn't i hate to use the word but quote unquote normal you know what i mean um so again that's very beautiful very wonderful and it just makes the character of amelie even more um in, uh, immersive incredible wonderful not, not just that like the, the actor audrey uh oh tatua i'm i'm, I'm I'm going to, I'm not going to say the last name because I feel like I'm butchering it. Um, but the, the, the lady that plays Audrey plays her so fantastically, so amazingly, um, so wonderfully. And she's beautiful. And she's got this big smile, big, beautiful eyes um, that when she smiles, you just feel giddy. It's kind of like one of those sort of, one of those faces, one of them smiles that if you just saw her in public, it would just make your day. You saw that, you'd be like, life is fantastic. Life is incredible because this person exists and they have such a beautiful wonderful smile that i i'm just enamored by it you know it's one of those smiles that just stick with you forever as well as the big eyes as well and it's just just very cute very lovely very loving you know i, I I'm, I'm just in love you know i'm enamored by the character you know i'm just in love with with the story with everything it's just watching this film and seeing uh, the actor just play this character you just it's honestly it's probably one of the the few moments in cinema where you watch something and you and you just forget that they're an actor where you just feel like this person is real this person exists and that a camera crew just followed them around for a bit and filmed their life this is what their life is so they are because like it was done in such a way that and and acted so perfectly that generally you couldn't tell where the acting began and where the real person ended it was just fluid it was like infinity it just went round in, a, in an infinite loop of just perfection of like there was no cut off as soon as the movie started to the movie ended you had it just felt like a slice of life it felt like amelie was a real person and that's just down to the acting and then you've got the layer of the story and then you've got the layer of of the autism then you've got the layer of the artistic and you've got the music and you've got everything and it's just layer upon layer upon layer that just builds up this foundation of just perfection you know of just wonderful small little things here and there that just add into the, the perfect building the perfect structure for the for a, a, for a story and like i said i i i don't speak french sorry but that was my uh, alexa going off i don't speak french i did french in school uh, i i was in top set and i spoke it a little bit uh, i understand it um somewhat um some bits i don't really remember but i understand it, the, the basics of french so i can understand what somebody's saying if they were just talking basically to me um but i don't have a, a huge knowledge of of or huge grasp of the language um and with this movie being a french film and it's you have to read the subtitles that doesn't matter i feel like even if there wasn't subtitles if you went to paris and you sat and you watched this movie in the cinema with no subtitles just has as it is as it was probably shown in france um visually because the art and because the acting i don't think it would matter if you knew what they were saying because again it's a very beautiful visual art form that and like i said the acting is so perfect by all the characters not just amelie but with all the characters that I just feel like you'd, you'd fall in love with it anyway, you know? Um, and uh, even with the fact of it, the movie does have subtitles and that, you know, I was worried at first of watching movies with subtitles because of me having my dyslexia and me struggling to focus on the, on what's going on on the screen and having to read it. Um, but my, my, my first attempt was with Train to Busan, the um, South Korean um, zombie horror movie, which was English subtitles. And doing so well with that film and having no issues with that and absolutely falling in love falling in love with that film, with it being one of the best and one of my favourite zombie movies of all time, um, 
then watching Amelie and also being somewhat not as worried, but just still a little bit worried that I'm going to love and enjoy it, even though it's not an English film, that I have to read the subtitles and then be able to read the subtitles and have so much passion for it and being able to know what the characters sound like if they were speaking English in my head just by reading it, even without actually knowing what they can, what they're saying, but from the visuals and from the acting and being able to also being able to read it, that I get such love for it. You know what I mean? How crazy is that? I don't understand what they're saying, but I can read what they're saying. And from what I'm seeing, it still comes off as, as beautiful as it would if I was a nat a, a native speaking Frenchman, you know? Um, and that's just the power of this story. It's just the power of Amelie. That's the power of the act. And it's the power of everything that, is, that goes into this film that all of that can come to fruition, can come to the surface. And me having no real ex grasp of the French language and have no real full on understanding of the language, but still being able to um, take in it all, take in everything and more and extra and seeing these little details just shows how beautiful this film is, how beautiful Amelie is, how beautiful the the, the, the work the, the work and effort that went into the, making this film. And I did say this part was going to be cringy, and I'm sorry if it has been, but me just gushing over the character and over the actor. Um, I like I haven't really seen her in many other things. I think the only other thing I, I remember seeing her in was uh, Angels and Demons with Tom Hanks, the Dan Brown movie. Um, or, oh, the Dan Brown book that the movie's based off. Um, she was in that, um, which I didn't know she was in that. It wasn't until I did my research for this, and I was like, oh, God, yes, she was. Because obviously that movie was done a couple of years later, and obviously she that she'd aged a bit. She didn't look as sort of as young as she did when she shot that film. Not that she's not beautiful, like don't rock, she's beautiful, like like she aged like a fine wine. She's gorgeous. Um, but it was just the fact of seeing it, and be like, oh, she was in that. Um, but she, I, I do remember loving her performance in that film and really, really enjoying Angels and Demons. I really like those films and I love those books as well. Um, so within seeing that, it was just a very sort of lovely sort of thing of like, I've seen other things and I do want to go out and I do want to look at other things that she's been in, other French or non-French sort of films and just kind of um, experience it because she's a very wonderful actress. Um, so that's me gushing over Amelie. Uh, I'm going to get into the to the style and into the music now. And then um, I'm going to quickly, uh, well, not quickly, but it's probably going to be a very long one anyway. So I'm not going to rush myself. And then we're going to go into the more deeper parts. So on to the music and the style of this beautiful, wonderful film. So... Uh, the, the the style and the music of of this movie is transportative you know it's they the director decides to use um a lot of pastel colors a lot of greens a lot of yellows a lot of reds um i'm not as entirely as to sure as to why when i was doing my research i couldn't as to to find a an exact reason as to why the director decided to use these colors but there are there are they are very prevalent there are very loads of quite rich greens, rich yellows, rich reds. Then you'll get the pastel sort of reds, yellows, and greens. Um, but it, this movie, like I said, it's very transportive. It's not just a movie for its time, as the as the 2000s when it was made, um, but also it's a slice of life during the 19, 1997 Fran France, or Paris, to be more specific. Um, it's also a very sort of as I mentioned, Amelie herself being autistic and it's following on with showing you uh, not just the look of her world, but how Paris would be perceived um, through the eyes of somebody with autism. And maybe that is to why um, he chose her sort of uh, colours to kind of represent how she see whenever she you're seeing the world through Amelie's eyes, that um, this is how, you know, best way to represent it. You know, maybe I don't know. It's because those colours are not always there. Those colours are not always prevalent. They're only there sometimes. So again, it could be th those colours show up whenever you're seeing the world through Amelie's eyes, and then it could change back to normal colours whenever you're just seeing the world as it is. Um, but the the movie makes me just want to 
the the art style of the of the film makes me just want to learn French again. It makes me just want to take a trip to Paris. Like I've like I'm a big fan of Paris, and I've been to France before. Um, I went to Normandy. I loved it. It, it was incredible time. But I've never been to Paris. Um, and I'm a big fan of the Owen Wilson movie, Midnight in Paris, which if you haven't seen that is another movie I highly recommend. It's a, it's a very beautiful, wonderful sort of film. Um, but I've, I've said many times that I would love to go to Paris. And w- one thing from doing my research that I've discovered, which I really, really need to do, is that there is a Amelie uh, tour of Paris where you can go to the uh, CAF where the, where Amelie worked and they actually, the CAF is stylized for um, Amelie. Um, so they do Amelie style food and you can have a creme brulee, uh, um, which I don't think I've ever really had. So it'd be nice to have it for the first time there. Um, and you can just go to the different sites, the, the different places where uh, Amelie was shot, and you can just explore Paris. And like, I've always wanted to go to Paris anyway. So I, I said to a friend of mine, like, I've got to get myself to Paris, and I've got to um, not just do a tour of Paris and do like the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, but I've got to do this tour, this Amelie tour, because it just, the art style and just watching this movie again, it just makes. It puts the magic into Paris. You know, it puts the the wonder, mysticism and wonderism into Paris because Paris is, is, you know, it's a very old city. And even though it is, there are parts that are quite modern, from what I've seen from friends that have been to Paris, Paris still virtually looks still quite, not old, but not modern. I don't know best what, what's the word to, to, to ex- explain the aesthetic of Paris. Paris is Paris, you know, it's, it's very much a, a, a moment of its time. And again, the Paris and French people are very much about um, keeping to, um, I was going to say what works, but that's a bad way to explain it. Keeping to um, the beauty of the beauty and the mysticism of it. There's no need to uh, upgrade and to do something that's new, to be very artful. And not Paris is very artful and very beautiful and old and wonderful as it is. And there's no need to, to, to change, really. Um, and like I said, not, the art style of this film just makes me want to go there and see it all, experience it all. Part of me, more than likely, there's a chance that it's changed. But from what I know of French culture, and as I explained just, I would like to think that if I went there, that those places would still look the same, that they would still have the same feeling, that they would have the, the same sort of um, emotions around it and just going there and seeing it and another thing that's on my bucket list is i'd love to go to a french cinema i'd like to sit and watch a french movie and i'd like to watch amelie specifically in a french cinema uh with subtitles or with not it doesn't bother me um just being able to sit there and experience um that film in the in the city in the country that it was made in the city that it's based i think would just be another sort of a different sort of experience than watching it on Netflix or watching it on DVD. Um, as I said, the art style is beautiful. And one thing that I've mentioned uh, fleetingly um, compared to everything else um, is the music as well. As I mentioned, you know, the... You know, um, I'm butchering it still, but that's just one of the, the one of the music. It's one of the most memorable piece of the music in the film but oddly enough is one thing i found as i was watching the film that's not one of the main songs as it, it, that song shows up here and there but it's never the, the full song it's never the whole um the whole lot it's just a snippet you know and i was just why that was kind of interesting how that piece of music became so unanimous with the film and it's one of those pieces of music when you play it people who know the movie know what know it instantly whereas it's not prevalent in the film at all well it is but it's not there as much you know there's 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 other very sort of french sort of music on there and i've listened to the soundtrack and the music is used in such a way that it's not it's not throwaway music it's not oh let's put some background music in because we just need something to fill in dead air to fill in space while she walks from one place to another. Each bit of the music is stylized. Like I said, this movie is very French. It's very different. It's very artsy. You know, it, it's not, it's it's kind of like a movie that you would see 
if it was, and I, I, I don't mean this as a slur, and I don't mean this as a as a way to discredit the the director or say that his work is terrible or it's or it's it's shockingly, but it's very much indie. It's very much like you, what you'd expect if you went to a university and you saw a university student, what they kind of like a film student, what they would create. It's very artsy. It's very indie. It's very different. It's not, it doesn't follow the, the norms of Western sort of cinema of what, uh, what we would need to do to make a movie successful here in the West. It's very much of like, the movie knows what it is. It knows what it's going for. The director has a vision. The director knows how a movie, how he wants his movie to look and just goes with it, you know? And I, from in my research looking into it, it looked, it seems like he struggled to get, um, he, his imagination, how he saw the world, he wanted to build sets, but the sets were too expensive and that he couldn't find anybody to really um, build the sets that he wanted to be able to match his creative vision so he ended up having to shoot on location which i believe worked better for the film because they made the movie seem more real you know it's made the movie seem a more slice of life whereas it's it wasn't just somebody's imagination this is generally like this is a slice of amelie's life amelie's a real person that this director's decided to follow her with a boom mic and a camera you know what i mean um, and that's just what it feels like. And again, you mix in with the with the stylings and the colours and the art of just the, the of how the movie shot. Add in the the music, the very contextual music of of not just France during this time, but very sort of um, beautiful harmonics that just kind of you just melt when you hear it. You just melt. And as I said, each bit of music has a specific reason, a specific place that when you listen to the soundtrack of this film after watching it, you can be, even after uh, only watching it for like one time, you could be like, if I'm listening to this piece of music, I know where it was used. I know what scene that was used. You know, if I'm listening to this piece of music, I know why, why, what scene that was used or why it was used here. And I had that from watching it from the first time. Now that could be because I'm a big, I'm a big movie buff. I'm a big film fan. And uh, I love how movies and movies are made, and I love uh, the breakdown and the background stuff of, of the idea of movies and what goes into them and cinema and all that. So maybe that was the reason why my brain was already in tune. But I could sort of listen to these music, and I could just see what the what the director was trying to do with that music, and also I can see the scene, and I I understand that each bit of music has a specific meaning to each scene. But I've spoken to people who don't have that sort of like concept of idea in the head of, of a big lover of movies and cinema, as I do. And they were able to notice it as well. They'd be able to listen to a piece of music and be like, oh, that was for this scene. That was for this scene. And what may, what other movies have you watched where you could say that? You know, where you watch any any other film and you could be like, oh, that piece of music was used here specifically. Not just it was used during this scene. It was used specifically for this part. It was used specifically for that. It was used for this character and this was used for that character. And it was used to explain this and it was used to explain that. And it was a way to do that, you know. Um, as I always say, music is, the ca- is, is a main character. It, the music is a character in a story that you never see but is always there. You know, if music is done right, if the compo- if the composer and the person that writes the music does it perfectly, does it right, that you can tell a story without words just by using the the music. You can tell how a character is feeling, if they're happy, if they're sad, if they're depressed, if they're about to lose their mind, if they're about to go crazy, if they're about to, to um, have a revelation. And again, this is why I come back to the idea of because of the the, the the music is done so well and it's composed so well, as well as the art style, that even if this movie had no English subtitles and it was just purely French, I still feel that I would enjoy this movie for the visual aesthetic alone and for the music on its own, you know, because the the aesthetic and the the music tell their own story and tell the story of Amelie without even needing to understand what anybody's saying, you know, um, like for example, there's a there's a play, Amelie, there's a, 
also do my research, there's a play of Amelie that I didn't know about. And part of me wants to go and watch this Broadway sort of play now of Amelie. I don't know. I don't know if it's being shown anywhere, um, but I'll have to have a look and see if I can find it and hopefully be able to see it at some time. Um, but the, the, the play is English speaking. As far as I am aware from doing my research, um, that the play is, is English speaking. So if you like plays, you know, definitely go check it out. I should obviously see the movie first. Um, but from what I've seen from scenes and from snippets from the play, it, again, it follows very artsy. Um, it follows very, very much um, the, the visions of the director a lot more than the movie did because, again, they were sets and they were big sort of visual sort of things. Um, but even so, I haven't seen the play. I've only seen snippets, but the play seems very beautiful. So I am sure that I would enjoy it. Um, and the, and it uses the same music and it uses the same sort of art style, pastel colours, that sort of thing and lighting to really sort of sell this sort of movie this narrative so again that should be really interesting to check out at one stage but yeah this this movie is just it's, it's just wonderful it's beautiful you know it, in terms of character and story and style and music and as i as i mentioned as i'm coming back to and repeating myself when you have a solid foundation and you just build up the layers and layers and layers and layers it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger and more fortified to the point of where um you get to it and it's just the perfect monument. It's the perfect statue, the perfect building, the perfect whatever, you know, the perfect movie. You know, I, I've watched, I just, not that I have looked for it, but from doing my notes, I was trying my best to kind of look for moments where the movie sort of isn't as strong, try to not, try to look at it without the rose tinted glasses. And I couldn't find a single part where I would like, I would be like, that was weak, that was bad, that was terrible, that was badly done, that was badly shot. They, they, I couldn't find a single, even just a nitpick, I couldn't even find a small nitpick, you know, a single thing where I was like, that was bad, that was dumb. Like not, There was never any moment of that. It was just, everything is just, that was perfect. That was that was incredible. That was wonderful. I'm in love. Incredible. Marry me. You know, that's all. Everything was just positive. And, um, yeah, you know, if I haven't at this point, uh convince you hopefully the deeper meanings that i'm going to get into now of this story um will convince you and if that doesn't convince you i don't know what will the best thing i could recommend uh was to go off and listen to the themes uh the the um song of the, the theme song of this film and what i'll end up doing on my twitter i'll just share that um that audio and that you can go on my twitter and you can check it and follow the link to the youtube and you can listen to it there and hopefully that will convince you if i haven't already um so to end it off and to cap it all off and to to get to to rounding off this um wonderful probably longest um, episode i've done ever um i want to talk about the deeper meanings the deeper messages and the, what it's trying to say without hopefully giving away any spoilers as best i can so let's give it a go shall we And finally, just before we, we get to the end and we close off for the day, um, I want to talk about uh, the deeper meanings behind Amelie. Um, I've wrote a few down as I was doing notes. Um, what my, my my interpretations of, of what this film um, is trying to say um, and what the deeper meanings are. Of course, when you get around to watching it, if you haven't watched it already, um, might be different to what I think, but this is just my my opinion and my feelings of what the deeper meanings and deeper messages behind uh, Amelie are. Um, so, one of the things with Amelie, uh, one of the feelings you'll get is, as a lot, as I said, as I mentioned, you see life differently. You see the life life through the eyes of Amelie. You know, you see the the life through the eyes of somebody who's autistic. You see the little things you see how somebody who isn't and again i hate to use this word but quote unquote normal sees the world you know what i mean and within seeing the world you learn to enjoy the small things you learn that the world isn't what you what you've been brought up to believe it is the world isn't you know oh trees are green and water's wet or water's blue you know what i mean there's more to it than that you've just got to look beyond it's, it's the idea of um of uh kind of like patch adams 
where the guy holds his hands up towards Patch, Patch's face, and he goes, "How many fingers I'm holding up? Like, what what do you see?" And like he, he, he says he's holding up four fingers, and eventually characters be like, "You're holding up four fingers," and he's like, "No, you got it wrong." And eventually Patch will come along, and he looks at it, and he looks at it, he looks through the fingers, and when you look through the fingers, there's more your fingers. You know, it's just the idea of he's looked beyond the fingers, he's looked what's behind it, and he's noticed that the fingers that in front of it, that are in front of his face have blurred, and because they're blurred, he's now seeing more than four fingers. He is seeing double of that. You know. And it, that sort of goes on with that character, and that and that's a different movie, uh, maybe for a different day. But it, the concept is still basically the same. It's when you look at something, instead, of don't look directly at something, look beyond of what you're seeing, and then look at the beauty that's in the world. You know, for example, most people, when they're walking in the park, for example, they don't take notice of the wildlife around them. It's just I'm taking a shortcut to work, or I'm cutting through the park um, because I want a bit of fresh air. But most people don't take into notice the fact of the squirrel that's just walked past them that's carrying loads of nuts or, you know, or the pigeons that are congregating in one little area of having a little fight or, you know, the the birds that are dancing in the sky above them that are having a romantic sort of dance and are going off to mate and to sort of... Um, enjoy life differently you know we just think because of humans the way we are and who we are and we're big and we're strong and we're mighty that uh we shouldn't sort of bother ourselves with the small things of what ants are doing you know what squirrels are doing but really if you sit and you look and you watch an ant and you just see how an ant how an ant colony works and you see how they all work together and how they all have their own little lives and their lives are to serve the queen or to protect the young or to have the hives or you watch the squirrels and the squirrels pur purpose in life is is to is to dig is to look for food is to procreate you know it's a very beautiful way of wonderful you know it's it's seen as little things things that you would just wouldn't take notice of and i have it myself in life where i i see life very differently to a lot of people i know that you know um and that there are things where, like, I've thought, oh, did you see that? It's beautiful, wonderful. And they've looked at me and they're like, look, I don't see it. You know, I, I don't know what you're trying to what you're trying to say. What what do you see? It's just like a leaf. And I'm like, no, but it's not just a leaf. Look, the, look at the life that's on the leaf. You know, look at the look at this leaf was in the trees and then it fell to the ground. And but it still has a life because it's helping you know other sort of um, creatures live off the leaf and they can survive and that sort of thing. It, it all works in tandem. It's the beauty of life. It's the it's the circle of you know of life of creation again it's the small little things and that's what Emily tries to show you as you look through her eyes and you see that she sees little things and you notice those little things and with a second viewing you noticed the small things that weren't prevalent the first time round, where um where you get that sensation of well maybe I should enjoy the little things in life maybe I should start look seeing the world differently maybe I should start looking at um how I how not sweating about the small things about enjoying life how that can in, in change my life how that can make me happy how you know just enjoying that not just the little things of life but the little sort of events of life you know for example uh if um you were upset you know but that you were baking some cookies and a lot of them got burnt but one little sort of cookie was fine you know yeah, all of them got burnt, but one was perfect, and it was beautiful, and it tasted gorgeous, you know. And it was the it was a beautiful little upside. It was a beautiful little detail that you know nobody else would know but you, but you just know that yeah, I might have burnt some cookies, but one was one was perfect, and I got to enjoy that one perfect small little slice of life, that small little moment that only I really know, only I've experienced, but um, it's still meaningful to me because I noticed it and nobody else did. I was there for it. Nobody else was, and it's personal to me. And nobody else will ever know or, or understand, but I will, and that's what matters. And like I said, that's what that's one of the one of the, the key parts of the story is just enjoying the little things. You know, Emily, she she skims stones. She she goes around the movie and she picks up very smooth sort of stones. And um, when she just and there'll be moments where she just goes off where she needs time to think and she needs time to relax and to get away from the world that she will go to a canal 
and she would just skim stones, not worrying about anybody seeing her, thinking she's crazy or thinking she's mental or why is a grown woman skimming stones. No care in the world at all. She goes around, picks up stones, finds smooth stones, and then she uses them to skim. And once she's skimmed all the stones, she'll go off and she'll live life. And if she finds more stones, fantastic. And then she put them in a pocket and then again, she'll skim stones again. It's so small little details that means nothing to anybody else, but means the world to her. It means the world to you. It's the small little things in life, the little foibles, little things that we have that mean nothing to anybody else that we've noticed, that we've cared about, that are meaningful to us. It's That's one of the really beautiful things of this movie, you know. Um, it, it, but the film's also about finding love. And it's not just not just love as in what we know as love. You know, it's not just love as in um, two people loving each other. It's also finding love for something other, other than, you know, like finding a love in books, finding a love in movies, finding a love in video games, finding a love in writing, in art, in walking, in riding a bike, in immersing yourself in nature, you know, finding a love and chasing it, chasing the dream, chasing the the proverbial fruit, you know what I mean? Ch- finding something you love and chasing it. And now in terms of Amelie, it's finding so- somebody to love, you know, finding love in yourself and then finding um, love in others through kindness, through helping other people um, and then using that to find love for yourself, to go out and to find it and chase it. You know, and don't let it go. If you find somebody that completes you, don't don't um and ah and go, what if? Let that person know that you love them, even if they don't love you back. At least you can sit there and go, I tried. You know, I told them that I loved them. I told them that I have feelings for them. They might not feel the same back, but at least I won't regret not ever knowing. At least I know that I tried and they weren't interested and that's fine. Now again, you could tr- you could tell them one thing I do, and I I don't I think I've mentioned this before, in terms of relationships and in terms of telling people that I love them. If I meet somebody who I generally have f- so much affection for and love for, and I feel myself falling for them, I will let them know. I will tell them that they're beautiful. I will tell them that they're wonderful, and I will let them know of like. I'm starting to get feelings for you. I'm starting to really sort of fall in love with you. Um, And for some people, it's not easy. It's not as easy as that. Some people find it hard to express that way. And I understand. I completely do. Um, But I always let them know as soon as possible. As soon as I start feeling it, I start to let that person know. Because what that means is at that point, they can then say one of two things. Either, oh, I, I think I'm starting to feel the same for you too. And then go on from there. And that way, you know where you stand and you know that that person likes you too. And there's no wishy-washy. There's no sort of worrying about them not loving you back or you loving them and putting all this effort in just for them not to like you. And it just stops the heartache, you know. Uh, So you learn at that point of they feel the same. It's great. Or you learn very early on that they don't feel the same and they just want to be friends. Um, And that way, you know where you stand early on so that there's no heartache, there's no sort of struggle. And that's one of the things about this film. It's it's about, you know, you find somebody that you love or you find something or somebody and you just chase it. You go after it. And like, like I said, in Amelie's case, she found somebody she loves. And in her little special sort of way, she dealt with the way she loves it differently. Uh, but that's kind of the same for everybody. People handle love differently. For me, I, I if I have affection for somebody, even if I don't love them in terms of wanting to be with them, if I think somebody's beautiful, whether it be uh, a woman or a man, I, I don't really care. If I think somebody's beautiful, I will tell them. If I think somebody it looks great, I will tell them, smells great. Um, or, you know, if somebody does something incredible, I will congratulate them. I'm not afraid to tell somebody how I feel about them. For some people, that's different. Some people struggle about that. And again, I understand. But that's, again, the beauty of life. The beauty of of Amelie, really, is she goes about showing that she loves some, this somebody um, quite differently. And I have my way of telling somebody how I love them very differently to other people. And I'm sure you listening to now, you have a different way of telling somebody how you love them, how you care about them, you know. So um, we all have different ways of... of 
chasing love, but the point is to chase it. No matter what it is, you get a love, whether it be a person or a thing, chase it and go for it, you know, because you'll never know if you just sit around and you don't go for it. Just go for it if, it, if and just let them know. And if it's heartache, then it's heartache. Um, but if it, it, but it could be love. And I think the idea that it could be something life changing is outweighs the heartache. You know what I mean? Um, but again, that that's just my my my, my opinion on that. You know, like I said, love's different. Love's love's a very grey area because everybody treats it differently. Everybody chases it differently. But I think, like I said, I think the point is just chasing it in the first place is the first step. Is the most is the common thing between all humans is that we we might do love differently, but the point is we all chase it. We're all after it, you know, and that's some commonality that we all have. Um, also, this movie shows that you should live to serve. And I don't mean live to serve as in, you know, pleasing everybody, but just sort of live to make yourself happy and others, you know, show like one thing I always tell people is that a smile is fantastic. A smile is one of the most powerful weapons uh, that humans have. You know, books are powerful, words are powerful, the mind is powerful, but a smile is incredibly, never underestimate a smile, whether it be a job interview or meeting somebody for the first time. If you go in with a smile, even if you don't feel it, if you go in with a smile, that immediately changes the mood in the room. If you're Even if you're nervous, if you go in and you smile, and show that I am happy, that I want to be here, that I want to meet you, that I'm happy to meet you, that I'm glad. That 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 tells you of a person that you know that they are sort of very passionate, that they want to be here, that they are. They might be nervous, yes, but they are sort of you know ready to go. Um, that they are serious about marrying my son, about marrying my daughter. That they um, that they are a very happy person and one of the things that i was that i'd always do if i'm ever out and about if i'm on the bus if i'm walking about in college university if i was walking about in the in the local shopping center even if i didn't feel even if i was really sad and i had a bad mental health day i would still put on a smile because a smile is a ripple effect you know you smile if you get on a bus, for example, and you're smiling, even if you don't feel like smiling, if you get on a bus and you lock eyes with a stranger or you're just smiling in general, if you smile, they, you don't know what sort of kind of day that person had. That person might have had a really bad morning. But just seeing you smile, it's, it's a human response. It's a natural response. that When you see somebody smile, you can't help not smile yourself. You can't help not feel good. For some unknown reason, for not benounce to me, um, it just when you smile or when you see somebody smile, you can't help not smile back, you know, and it causes a ripple effect. That person could then go into work or go into go home and could meet their loved ones or meet their uh, sort of, um, you know, their work colleagues and smile and that cheers them up. And then they go out and that cheers other people. up, And it's a ripple effect. And next thing you know, you've made an impact and made a small change in people's lives that you'll never meet you'll never ever know the impact you have but just from the power of a smile you've changed the lives of probably hundreds and hundreds of people because it's just ripple effect it's just gone person that every person that person meets they smile then they meet people and they smile and they meet people and that's you know you smiling even though when you don't feel like it you have that adverse effect you know and it's just that idea of being happy, being to make yourself happy, to cheer yourself up, and even when you don't feel happy, to make other people to make other people smile, even if without putting loads of effort in, even despite having a smile, you know, to cheer other people up has the power of it, and that makes me happy. Even when I have my bad, my my worst days, just being out and about, knowing that I'm smiling, that I'm happy. And that other people are seeing me and they might not know why I'm happy or they might look at me and go, oh, God, why is that guy smiling for? Inertly, for some unknown reason, they would just want to inherently smile. They want to inherently um, feel better because they've saw you feel better. You know, now you what you do get some people out in the world who are quite sour, who will be like, oh, why are you smiling for? You know, I don't want to smile. Life's terrible, blah, blah, blah. You do get those people in life. And granted, you can't please everybody. But majority of people, when you smile, when you see somebody smile, they will smile back and a smile changes lives. And it's just that idea of if you are 
if you can make yourself happy by by smiling then you will inherently yourself feel better meaning that you won't have to put a face on you will generally swell because you feel better you know what i mean so live for yourself live to to make yourself happy and live to make others happy you know um by making yourself happy you will make other people happy it's a circle you know even if you don't feel happy you can make other people happy by talking to friends by helping friends by being kind being um loving being um i was gonna say virtuous is virtuous a good word you know being um just kind at the end of the day just be kind just be loving just even if you don't want to smile you're just giving advice you know talking to a stranger making a joke small little things like i said enjoy the small things it's the small things in life that makes people smile the biggest you know that's one of the things about this movie is that amelie she goes off and this one little small act changes her life so much that she goes comes out of a shell and she decides to make other people's lives happy to help other people to support other people to stop people being bullies to um change the people's lives around her to the point where people are happier that they're better that they are um they've just got a better slice of life you know a better piece of life their might their life might have been bad up until that point but at that very moment their slice of life their little sliver of being is made better just because she made a small change that she decided to smile or she decided to help somebody give somebody advice um and that's that's just the effect that small things have small the smallest of stones have the biggest of ripples in the in the river you know you might put a big stone in it has a big splash but that big splash will slowly start will slowly sort of decimate will disappear whereas loads of little things instead of one big splash loads of little splashes will last longer and have longer ripple effects than one big splash and that's why i say it's the small things just think as small as smiling even though when you don't feel like smiling just a small thing of smiling instantly cheers up a room instantly cheers up the people instantly makes things just better you know because smiling is just one of them sort of things that when you see it inertly you just in you, you feel better in yourself and people around you feel better and life in itself is just better when we're all kind to each other when we all smile and again this is just one of the things that emily um sort of shows but one of the most important things and one of the one of the final messages that i'm going to say before i sort of wrap things up one of the the deepest parts of amelie that i love and means a lot to me is don't most importantly don't forget to live you know it's one thing as i mentioned at the beginning with amelie she 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 doesn't leave the house she's an introvert you know she goes to work doesn't have really have any friends apart from the people that she works with she doesn't really have any she don't really have a boyfriend or anything like that she generally just goes to work does a bit of shopping come home lives her life and that's it basically she she lives the routine of just doing that over and over no different no change um and obviously that one little thing that happens kind of changes her life um forever and makes her a new person basically takes her out of a shell and it's just the idea that that concept of it's don't forget to live you know it's all well and good obviously now especially now with covid of staying indoors and staying at home for for two years you know granted you know the, the virus is still around and it still bothers me and it still worries me of going out and about and potentially getting ill or getting ill or not knowing about it and passing it on to somebody else that's still a very thing that terrifies me but it's still the idea of live a little you know get out you know do do something you know um don't forget to live don't forget to 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 make friends don't forget to fall in love don't forget to um to follow your dreams to do something that you love don't not just find somebody that you love but find a passion find a hobby you know i've said it before but the the, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent you know um, I got that of Chaz Palmateri, who was a fantastic uh, director and actor. And it was something that his father said to him when he was very young. And it was something that he's taken through life 
um, with himself and it's something that I take through life with myself and it, if I ever have kids it's, it's one thing that I will tell my kids is the saddest thing in life is wasted talent if you have talent chase it if you have a love chase it. if you have a passion chase it um, don't forget to chase life don't forget to live life you know uh, I like to spend time indoors I like to read and I like to do audiobooks and I like to do podcasts I like to listen to podcasts I like to play video games and stuff like that but even I will admit that you know I starting to miss out on life on, on the experiences of life obviously i have my reasons as to why i don't go out because of sort of you know what's going on in the world as well as me living with a, with a chronic illness it's a bit difficult um but even with watching this movie it made me cry because it was just the idea of i i'm i am it sounds going to sound silly but i am amelie the idea of not wanting to go outside the house, wanting just to live a normal routine, to stick to my routine, to not to live, to just to not chase things, just to follow the path that I'm I'm comfortable with. But you know, it's the idea of jumping off that comfortable path and just chasing life. And now things are starting to die down with what's going on in the world, and well, in terms of the, the pandemic, that is, and um, just deciding that you know it's time to get back out there that slowly and surely I want to get back into the world and there are people listening to this who are probably already out in the world and I say to those people who are already out in the world to go chase it you know go chase love life everything passion no matter what it is don't forget to live live your life enjoy it um, and for those of you like me who stay at home who haven't ventured out yet we can do it you know we can event I know it's going to be difficult for us but I think we can do it we can eventually get out into the world and we can see friends make friends find love um and yeah i think that we w in time we can do it you know we but we would do it at our own speed and we'll do it at our own pace but we you know we will keep that idea in mind of like we will don't forget to live and we will keep remember to live and we will go off and we will live and we will be happy it would just take us a bit longer than uh, anybody else but we can do it you know um so that's the deeper messages of amelie uh, i've gone on a bit longer than i thought i feel like i've gone a bit more hippy dippy and spiritual than i had planned to um but that you know it comes with the subject matter so it's completely fine um so that's the deeper messages uh so it's time to uh to wrap it up to to come to the end sadly um so yeah let's uh let's end this with a bang shall we So that's it. Uh, that's all she wrote, as they say. Um, that has been my um, my Amelie and me and the breakdown of, of this movie and trying my best to uh, show why I love this film so much and why it means so much to me. Um, it's one of the movies that whenever it comes up, of what film would you recommend? It's always one of those now that comes up and I'm like, you've got to watch this film. Yes, it's not. It's English subtitles and it's not. A, it's a French film, but generally it would change your life. And I've recommended it to loads of friends. I mean, hopefully, you know, it, I've convinced uh, you folks listening uh, to to go out and check it out. If you've got, if you're in the UK, uh, like I said, it's it's in on Netflix, so you don't have to pay for it. Um, you can just watch it on Netflix. Um, if you're not in the UK, I'm sure you could probably find it on DVD somewhere for uh, for cheap. I managed to get mine secondhand. I think it was like uh, three pounds, two to three pounds on uh, on eBay. But uh, it, the movie means a lot to me. Um, to be honest, I actually, I actually think that the film, because it again, say what you will, you might think I'm crazy. But uh, I was actually thinking about what ideas should I should do for this episode uh, two weeks ago, and I was thinking about ideas. And one of the things that kept happening, again, I've got my shelf, and it, my shelf is full of movies and video games, and it's kind of hard to explain. But how I've got Emily, it's sticking out majority of it's it's sticking out quite a bit but um because it's wedged in between other sort of games it has that pressure and force where it doesn't sort of slip out and fall on the floor and it's been like that for you know since i watched it i've stuck it there and it's been there fine you know no matter how much i've gotten out of bed and i've banged or i've moved about that thing this movie has not fallen or has not has not moved at all and then as of late as of two weeks ago when i was playing to do the to, to what to do next for my review Every time I'd come upstairs, Amelie would be on the floor. It'd be it 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 just fallen out, or like it would um. Or I or I'd be just sitting there, and it would just slowly start to move. Now, 
was it ghosts was it spirits was it you know the universe telling me to to review or to talk about this movie i don't know or was the movie itself is it alive is it haunted was it like i want to be watched you know maybe if you're looking for an idea maybe you should talk about me i don't know but as a being a very spiritual person potentially it was the universe telling me like you, this is your next thing that you're going to talk about uh, is amelie because like i said it's been there for since i watched it last year um around october time um it, it, it's been on the shelf. It hasn't moved. I've banged. I, you know, it's right next to my bed. I've moved about. I've gotten out of bed, you know, stumbling around. Never once has this movie even moved an inch. But as of when I'm trying to figure out what to do next for the podcast, and instantly it just started to move and fall around and kind of take my notice. Um, yeah, you know, creepy, spooky, but I have a feeling now I'm going to put that movie back after doing this and it's not going to move ever again. And maybe it will move. It will move again when it wants me to watch it again, or when the universe feels like I need to see this film again. Who knows? But um, yeah, I hope I've convinced uh, you folks uh, to give it a listen. Um, I want like there's many things that I wanted to do for this podcast. Like I'm like, even though I've done a lot, and I feel like this is probably going to be the longest one I've ever done. Um, but I I wanted to do like fr- I wanted to have French uh, a French intro and uh, French interludes, like French music, and I was looking for free use ones all over the internet i was looking for ones that i could use that i could um you know uh, add in to have into this kind of add to the feel of amelie kind of the french vibe um but i couldn't find any free ones that were decent um some were too long some were too short like really really short like under five seconds like three three seconds sort of thing and i would wanted a minimum of five to six um so I just decided I couldn't in the end. Also, like I wanted to play the, the, that song that I kept talking about, the one that means a lot to me and kind of was the the pushing point for the, for me to be like, you've got to go buy this movie now. Um, because of copyright. Uh, if copyright didn't exist, well, if it didn't exist, things would probably be quite bad in the world. Um, but like if copyright wasn't as, like, as strong or if like uh, Spotify or Anchor kind of was like, more forward with how things work in that perspective um then i would have happily sort of played like only like five to ten seconds at best of the song not probably not a lot but um i paid enough to kind of get a feeling of what i was talking about but there's a lot of things i wanted to do which i i didn't i couldn't do because of like legal reasons or because i couldn't find anything but i'm kind of in a way i'm i'm i was peeved off that i had a week off of being ill um, because i wanted to do this episode um but in, in, in upside again the little things one of the upsides was that even though i was ill i still had an extra week to do research and to look at small little things and to to learn a bit more about why the the director decided to do certain things like the movie comes with a, a uh audio commentary by the director i haven't seen it and i, I don't really watch co- director commentaries i know friends that i have friends that do it's never been something i've really been interested in um but i feel like this is a movie that maybe i will watch the director commentary on um if it's in english i'll have to check it out no my look it's probably in french um and also no no my look it's probably in french without subtitles as to what the director's saying so um i'll have to check it out and i'll let i'll report back and let you folks know if that is the case or not fingers crossed it isn't fingers crossed it is uh, english subtitles um for the for, for the director's you know commentary so i can get a better understanding of the film but um yeah i hope you enjoy it hope you like it um i don't know if i'm going to do a side quest uh this week and if i do more than likely it'll probably be another shorter one probably a, a book review for world war hulk because i finished that um recently and uh I, you know I, I, I can talk about it for a bit so maybe i'll do a side quest and it'll be a book review we'll see um but i hope i convinced you hope you enjoyed your time here uh, listening to me talking about amelie um my one of uh, a love of my life you know um a couple of updates quickly uh, before i go uh, i've changed my name on twitter to the nostalgic podcast and my n- new twitter handle is nostalgic underscore pod um so just put nerdstalgic underscore pod 
or just put the uh, nerd stage podcast and it should come up with uh, it should come up still um, so that's so I've changed my name on Twitter just to kind of follow on more so with the podcast and be a lot more podcasty sort of thing it's easier to find um, also uh, I haven't changed my icon yet so it's still my face on fire with a skull so I'm easier to find I am looking to hopefully uh, acquire or be, ask somebody to do me a banner and a new icon specifically for the um podcast haven't got around to it as of yet um but i'm hoping that i've also got a friend of mine who is working on some audio so hopefully get some more customized um, audio for the intro as well as interludes fingers crossed um i haven't been able to get in touch with him because i haven't been well last week so hopefully i can get in touch with him and we can get some new custom music um so a bit more personalized to my style and what i'm trying to do here um but yeah, so it's all coming up, Trumps. It's all doing good. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, again, don't forget to follow me on my on my Twitter, uh, the nerdstalgic underscore pod, uh, or just type in the nerdstalgic podcast. You should find me there. Um, again, if you listen to this on Spotify, uh, don't forget to rate on Spotify. And uh, if you're listening to new, thank, welcome. Thank you for listening. If you're an old listener, I love you very, very much. Uh, yeah, I... I I appreciate all of you people who've been sticking by me for this adventure and everybody who asked me where, like when I was ill, where I was and what's going on means a, a lot. And um, yeah, that's about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop waffling. Stop taking up your time. And uh, I said my thank yous and follow me on Twitter and all that, all that jazz. And um, yeah, so as always, stay sexy, stay active. I love you all peace and you have been listening to another episode of nerdstalgic with me your host luke the ginger bookworm thank you for listening